percent of what they say is almost verbatim um, what the guys actually said. So, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> the question was, did he use heroin or no? Um, I, I can't answer that. I, I never knew the man. So I think, I think there's a lot of speculation. If you, um, I mean, if you're curious, you can do some Google searches and read about it. There's a, um, uh, I mean, this is obviously, David Lipsky's book is a memoir about his very limited amount of time that he spent with David Foster Wallace. They weren't friends before um, and didn't stay in touch afterwards, but there's a good biography of David Foster Wallace by D.T. Max um, called Every Love Story is a Ghost Story, which you can, which you can find. Um, yes? To what extent did David Foster Wallace's critique on media and his sort of character inspire your aesthetic, and why did you choose to film it just as this sort of dialogue and uh, simple sort of close-up type thing versus the, the larger story? Yeah, the question was, I'm paraphrasing, but how did David Foster Wallace's critique of media influence the film, and why did we decide to shoot it sort of um, just sort of close up sort of two guys talking as opposed to, I don't I actually don't know what the alternative would be, but um, <laughs> animated, <laughs> real explosions of the from Broken Arrow. Um, you know, I mean, I can only speak for myself. Um, you know, I find personally traditional biopics, you know, like Cradle of the Great Biopics where you see someone at age five and that offers the key to understand why something happens then four years later. I find them really reductive. Um, I, I mean, I can do the same thing for Wikipedia, usually. Um, and I, 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 I love conversation. What I love, I think there's something inherently limited um, to, to the biopic. And what I loved about um, the possibilities of this film is there's something so inherently subjective. There are huge blind spots that the very structure of the film acknowledges. Like, we don't speculate, you know, about David Foster Wallace, you know, really about any of the questions, you know, one that was asked before is, you know, um, Anything about him, what we know is what David Lipsky knew. Um, you know, I, I'm a Wallace obsessive, so I, I read everything, but it's it's really just what, what Lipsky experienced during that time. Um, and it's a relationship film, you know? In some ways, it's an unrequited um, platonic love story. You know, a Lonely Souls film, and it's just about their time together, you know? And if it, you know, if we had told the story of David Foster Wallace 10 years later, it would have been a completely different story, but I, I personally wouldn't have been interested in that story. Just thinking back to something uh, Donald Marty Lee said, you know, he's a playwright, and for a while this was being discussed as a play, and he said he just found it irresistible to not put this dialogue and, and this experience these two people had painted on the landscape of, you know, that part of America. And what's interesting is we shot um, Western Michigan for Illinois, and it looks exactly the same in some of those two places. I mean, that's the drive down with sort of the fast food on each side, and it, it, that could be anywhere in America. Um, so, I think for for all of us, it was it was cool to pit the, those images against the dialogue that they were having. Thank you for the question. Yes, um, I was uh, deeply moved by the by the interplay between the two actors. Uh, I thought this, the silence and the spaces, uh, which is what good playwriting is about, too, um, were very, very deeply moving, and, and that you held back pushing, um, and the actors held back pushing the, uh, the dialogue, so to sense. And I think that that rhythm and that timing was deeply, deeply moving. So I want to compliment you on that. And I wanted to know if that was something you were working for, or is it just something that I found in your film? The other is the soundtrack is. Um, did did you do the music supervision or did someone else? Because it's uh, it's nice to hear REM, for example. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll try to summarize. Um, the question was sort of uh, the first question was about sort of the pacing of the dialogue and the silences, and was that sort of intentional or was that sort of something that just sort of came up? Or did the actors just bring that? Or did the actors bring it up? And the second question was about the soundtrack. Um, um, you know, it, 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 the, the pacing of the dialogue, I mean, I'm just good, good at, this is a cliche, but good acting is, is good listening, you know? Um, and both of these guys, um, David Lipsky was and is a first-rate journalist, and David Foster Wallace um, was a phenomenal um, nonfiction writer as well. They knew how to listen. Um, and I think 
for me, there's nothing more compelling than someone thinking and listening. And, um, you know, I mean, so much of this, I have no idea whether David Foster Wallace ever actually let his guard down around David Lewski. That's up to you guys. Um, we'll, we'll never know. Um, he was a very guarded person. He was at the tail end of a sort of media blitz for this book. He had to talk about it a lot. Um, most publicists, there's no way in hell they would let um, their clients spend five days with a, like embedded journalist. Um, I think he was really exhausted by the end of that time. Um, and, you know, probably made, he was trying to be vulnerable, um, maybe vulnerable to someone who didn't necessarily deserve that vulnerability because he was really competitive with them. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and so much of that comes also from the actors, from Jesse and Jason and all the other actors who are just phenomenal and really trusted each other, trusted me, trusted the material. Um, they're just fantastic. They were collaborators 100%. They're real artists. And Jesse and Jason, um, I think, really understood the text at, at, at a deep level. They're also, I mean, it's worth noting, Jesse Eisenberg and Jason Siegel are both successful writers. Jesse writes off-Broadway plays, New Yorker humor pieces. Jason writes big studio comedies, your Muppets children's book. Um, they're smart guys. They think like writers. They happen to be actors. Um, and then the question about the, uh, the soundtrack. A, a lot of that music was um, stuff from very early on. I mean, I'm, I'm a music obsessive. I started writing for music publications in Athens, Georgia when I was 15. I interned at Rolling Stone, actually. Um, but I, I, I <laughs> go to Alex, we'll say that. Yeah. Um, um, so, and some of that music um, were things that they were listening to with Brian Eno you know, at the end, um, you know, something they were into, R.E.M. And um, some of the things came from conversations that I had with people who um, were very close to David Foster Wallace at that time. And I worked with a really phenomenal music supervisor named Tiffany Anders, um, who I've worked with um, a couple times now. And then we were lucky to work with a great composer, Danny Elton. So it was a real collaboration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? One more. Make a good one. Yes. Um, really phenomenal movie. Thank you. Jason Siegel in this movie is something else. Um, I've always been a huge fan of his, but like, it's, it's an incredible performance. And I was just wondering, what was your process working with him and his process to uh, tap, into, tap into this man? Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think you all heard that. Um, <laughs> no, uh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been a fan of Jason's forever as well, going back to Freaks and Geeks, um, you know, which I think is one of the best cast teen ensembles ever, along with my so-called life, Merrick Graffiti, Daisy Confused. Um, and, um, you know, some, some of the other actors coming out of that television show went more immediately into the more dramatic work, you know, James Franco, but um, for me, Jason Siegel was the emotional core of that show. Um, I always just found him to be vulnerable and honest, and I sort of leaned into him as an audience member and sort of wanted to hang with him or hug him or something. Um, and I, I've actually felt that way, you know, I love his performances, and I love you, man, for getting Sir Marshall, and, Muppets. Um, so he, he's a really phenomenal actor who, um, you know, spent the past nine years on a sitcom. So I think some audience members might make presumptions, you know. Um, but um, it, it was all there with him. And, you know, he and I had long conversations. Um, you know, and he, he knew the stakes of getting this right. And he knew that if he got it wrong, um, it would be, could be crucified, I think. Um, rightfully so. I mean, people, um, fans of David Foster Wallace are which I consider myself a major fan. Many of the people who worked on the film are as well, are very proprietary of him. Um, you know, Jason, he, the superficial things, um, the physicality of Wallace, the, the voice, I mean, those are things that Jason worked on, uh, on whether it's working with a dialect coach or just sort of studying footage of Wallace. I mean, there's quite a bit if you want to go on YouTube. Um, I recommend tonight, if you guys want to see a really great interview, he was on Charlie Rose in 1997, which was a year after this, and you get a sense of how charismatic he was, how vulnerable, how funny he was, how he understood the media game, um, he really got it. Um, but I think Jason also was not looking to do an imitation, he didn't want to do a caricature, this wasn't a Saturday Night Live sketch, so I think he really wanted to understand from the inside um, out like the, where, where Wallace was coming from. Which was, um, you know, he was like, he was trying to relate to other people. So I think that's, you know, and Jason did listen to these tapes as well. Again, not to imitate, but to to, to have his own take on Wallace's intention and you know the games that these two guys were playing. You know, to really understand, you know, when Lipsky flatters him like, hey, you you look good in your book jacket photo. To have a real take on would he have been vain? Would he have bought into that? Would he have played the game right back? Um, 
And then Jason also did spend some time um, uh, with um, someone who was very close, very close to Wallace at that time, and helped answer a lot of those questions for him as well. Is there anything like that? I don't know. I, it was interesting. What didn't start out as the obvious choice turned into the perfect sort of lucky happenstance. We were so lucky to get him. And the body type thing was, you can't underestimate that. His, his body type was uncannily similar to Wallace, mm -hmm. and that sort of brooding physicality. Um, and what Jason brought to the table was an intelligence behind the eyes, and, and sort of a soulfulness that had to be there to be believable as a, a genius author. Um, so at the end of it, we couldn't believe we thought of anyone else, or, or he was considered anyone else. He was, he's also such a great human being, so. Thank you very much, we really appreciate it.